in the first century, there were no there were no book presses, printing presses. Yeah. If there was such a thing as an apostolic letter sent to a group of believers, that was treasured, read out, passed to others, read it. Yeah. And someone who could read, read it out to those who had no hard copy. Yeah. And who had to pick it up from hearing it. And blessed are those, says John, who read and respect the <clears throat> what I'm writing about this vision. I'm writing it under instruction from the Lord so that His people should heed the things that are. There's a difference between hearing and heeding. Yeah? You can hear anything you like. Do you take note of and do you obey what you hear? It's heeding that God wants from His church. And He says, the time of these things happening that are being disclosed in this vision is about to start happening. So here's the message to the seven churches. And the Lord has singled out, as we're going to see in chapters 2 and 3, these seven churches that have been planted during the first century in Asia by Paul the Apostle, guided on his missionary journeys. Now look, why are the churches of Asia being particularly singled out? For these messages yeah because of their historical role and responsibility that is yet to be understood by them they don't know that in 200 years they're going to be the churches evangelizing the Eastern Roman Empire yeah the Eastern Empire is shifting into a capital in Turkey. Yeah. Constantinopolis. Polis, the city. The city of Constantine. The first Caesar who became a professing Christian. Yeah. And these churches are going to be the source from which evangelism will move into the Eastern Roman Empire and spread up through those eastern, the countries we now call the Eastern Bloc countries, the countries that became part of the Russian Empire. Yeah? Those, those countries, evangelism there, through what became known as the Greek Orthodox Church, because the Greek influence was so strong in Eastern Europe. Yeah. That's where Alexander had carried the Greek Empire to, into Persia, yeah, in the east, further east than Turkey, of course. The influence of the Greeks is so strong in Eastern Europe that the church, based in Constantinople, acquired a Greek flavor, yeah, and became known as the Orthodox Greek Church, still known as that today. Up in Russia, the Greek Orthodox Church. So they're being singled out because of a future historic development. Yeah? Paul didn't know that when he got led into a missionary journey throughout Asia, the province Roman province of Asia. He only knew that he was guided of God to base himself for two years in Ephesus, that major city on the coast, the port city of the Asian province, <laughs> where people from the hinterland, inland, were continually coming to Ephesus to in connection with essential trade 
around the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean, that sea in the middle of Europe. The Germans call it Das Mittelmeer, that middle sea, yeah, around which Europe and the Middle East and North Africa is built. And John, the beloved apostle, that man who knew Jesus so well that the other apostles, the disciples, would say to him, we didn't understand what he was talking about. Would you ask him, you, you get the explanation and tell us. Yeah? And he's now the beloved apostle of the churches that have for 50 years been planted out around the Mediterranean. Yeah. The church of Jesus with its original headquarters in Jerusalem itself extending because of the fall of Jerusalem extending into a capital uh, a, a, a headquarters if you like in Antioch because that was the central point for the focus on Gentile evangelism and here's dear John exiled banished by a Roman emperor who considers that Christianity is dangerous and subversive to the control by his empire. And he's punished John, thinking that he's going to bring the activity of the Christian churches to a halt by banishing the key, the key figure in those early decades of Christianity. Because in the 60s of that first century, just before the siege of Jerusalem and the Holocaust that expelled them from the empire, just before that, the Apostle James had been executed. And because Nero, that insane Caesar saw that the Jews were quite happy about that he proceeded to try to execute Peter also well by the end of the decade Peter had been executed and so had the great missionary apostle Paul and this beloved apostle Who, when Peter queried Jesus and said, I want you to tell me what you expect of him so as I can keep an eye on him and see that he does what you want. Ah, says Jesus to Peter. Peter, look after yourself, son. Don't be trying to control that man. If I want him to continue doing what I want him to do, even until I come. You leave that up to me. I'll take care of the job. But he's banished, exiled. So he can't effectively run the churches. But already his letters are circulating. His gospel and his letters, the epistles, are circulating amongst the churches. The spiritual rule of the Lord over his people is continuing. It's not brought to a halt because John is exiled. But there he is on a lonely mountainous island, Patmos, 50 miles off the coast of Turkey or Asia. 
There's no monastery high up on the crags of Patmos, not until the 11th century when the Crusaders, yeah, in honor of John's exile on Patmos, build a monastery high up on the crags of Patmos. But I dare say John climbed up on the crags to overlook that coast in the distance <coughs> where the seven churches are growing that Jesus has specified as having his message at this time. And he's going to tell of a personal vision of Jesus that authenticates the vision that he's being given. Who knows the Lord better than him? But he's in awe at this meeting with his Lord. Yeah. It's not the Lord who was rejected by Israel. It's the Lord bearing the marks of his role on the throne of God at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. And John says, I was in awe of him and I fell at his feet. Yeah. And the Lord raised me up and said, don't worry, my boy, I'm the same Jesus that you knew. Yeah. But he shows the traces of the experience that he's had since John last saw him. White-haired, yes, eyes flaming like fire, yeah, a voice that sounded like the waves of a great ocean breaking on the shore, yeah, this is metaphoric stuff that's going to be applicable to the metaphors of the vision. And feet. Not like the clay feet of that vision of empires that collapse, but feet of bronze that have cut. Bronze is a furnished, furnished metal. It's come through the fires of being furnished. This is the Jesus, the Lord of a church, his church that will advance through fires of persecution. Persecution that will not stop its advance. Yeah? But persecution that will make it stronger to advance in carrying out the will and purpose of God. Oh, look, we could spend all day on Revelation 1. Yeah? Meditate on it. Draw strength from it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it explains his relation to his churches. That he kindles. He kindles a church to be a source of light. He kindles it by lighting it with stars. Stars, their light doesn't go out. Jesus doesn't intend the light of his church of his church to go out. So he kindles the branches of it with yeah, s stars that he holds in his hand. Daniel had said, Oh, blessed are they that turn many to righteousness. Those are the people whose light goes on shining forever. Yeah. Jesus is kindling churches that will send the light of righteousness into a darkened world. That's not a note that we especially emphasize in today's world. We've, as, we've assimilated so much of the culture of the world that we live in, yeah, that we extinguish that note of the gospel. Is it any wonder 
that we've lost our power to draw people yeah, to righteousness. That our nation goes rampantly into unrighteousness. Yeah. Jesus is going to talk about that to his churches and say, you know, if you lose that light, what do I have you for? Why should I hang you on my menorah, my lampstand of light? You know the menorah in the Old Testament. Yeah. The seven-pronged candlestick in which God taught Israel <coughs> that they were intended to be light to the world, light to the nations. Yeah. We've forgotten about that, haven't we? We've forgotten that that's the light that we have to shed. That that's what we're here for. Yeah. I picked up a copy of Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. Yes? yes? Where that's obviously his follow-up to uh, The Purpose Driven Church. I'm struck by the little comment along the bottom. What on earth am I here for? Yeah. The purpose of God. Our Lord says to His churches, if your light goes out, what on earth are you there for? Yeah. If your light goes out, Jesus says, I came to you, my Father sent me, and I became light to the world. Yeah? Yeah. The light of life, John 1. Yeah? I'm the life, the way of a life that is the truth that leads men to God. Yeah? That's the light of Jesus. And that's the light that the church, that the churches are supposed to be shed. A light lit life. Yes? A life of righteousness that creates a light out into the world so that men that want to know the way to God can find it through the church of Jesus. Yeah? And verse 20. The seven golden lampstands. Golden. Jesus says, My people are precious to me. And that's a theme that we could expand on from the Old Testament. The things that are recorded as being precious to God. Precious to God are the lives of His saints. Right. So, chapter 2. The seven particular churches. Singled out. But when we get to chapter 4 and get our glimpse into heaven, we're going to be... We're going to see the Holy Spirit referred to as the sevenfold Spirit of God. Now, does that mean that God's got seven different spirits? Or does it mean that the Holy Spirit is going to be engaged in a seven-fold visitation to the church over the, the two millennia in order to accomplish what God has in mind to establish in the world through the agency of His churches, of His church? capital C. Yeah. And then we're looking at the same act of creation as uh, in Genesis 1, where God has seven successive engagements yeah, to create what He wants to finish up with. Yeah. And I've pointed out to you at the Easter camp that God never moves ahead to a second stage until he's got the stage he's working on, how he wants it. He will not, he will not use an 
incompleted stage yeah, on which to eliminate a further development. Yeah? God wants every stage of his work certified it's ready to proceed, safe to proceed. I've accomplished what I need. Yeah. So I can I can proceed further. Yeah. First message to Ephesus. Yes, well you know from the book of uh, Acts the history of what originated in Ephesus, that city that was given over to the temple of Diana, Diana of the Ephesians, the goddess, the huntress goddess of the Greeks. Yeah. And the living made by the golds, by the silversmiths, sorry, of Ephesus, who made images for Di of Diana. That the worshippers who came to the temple of Diana in Ephesus <coughs> could take away with them as a memento a symbol of the goddess that they worshipped. Yeah. That's where a work began in Ephesus. Yeah. Much to the objection of the silversmiths who saw their prophets being whittled away by the conversion of citizens to the God of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but you notice that in these messages, the Lord always begins by commending them for what they're doing right. Yeah. Before, he has to call them to account for what is happening wrongly. And you'll notice that as you go through the seven churches, there are things either invading newly as assimilated evils out of the world that they're transacting with. There are the emergence of new evils. And there's the loss of obediences to former corrections. Yeah? There's going to be a, a building up of the state of the church, capital C, represented by these churches. There's going to be the building up of an accumulating spiritual state where some of the churches will show the effect of having made correction according to what the Spirit has said to them to bring them back onto track with the Lord, yeah? So they are indeed giving the light to the world that He has lit them for, yeah? You, he's, he's talking to Ephesus about this deterioration that sets in over the years, you know? Lit with a, with a burst of you know, Christian activity, true Christian experience, and how gradually that experience is founded on the love to the Lord, the fact that God initiated His relationship with us. God didn't wait for us to love Him. It was commanded. That's a love of the Lord, the beginning of righteousness. Commanded. But who's to say that it was done? Yeah. What did God do about it? God didn't just rebuke us because we didn't love Him with all the heart, soul, mind and strength. God initiated an approach and Paul says, so now we love Him because He first, He initiated love to us and we responded to that love. Yeah. But gradually, says, says the Lord to the Ephesus church, 50 years on, yeah, he says, the thing I've got against you is that that first love 
that's ebbed away. Yeah. And the problem of the Christian experience then is that then obedience will leave the picture. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey. Yeah. <laughs> so if the love goes out, yeah, the obedience goes out. Well, of course, Christian marriage has always been patterned on the relationship of God's people to him in his covenant. So the Christian marriage service has always been a pattern of the covenantal relationship with God. Yeah? When when love ebbs out of a marriage, you're not going to protect a vow that says to love, honor, and obey. <laughs> That's going to go out the window. Yeah? Because it's built on love. Yeah? And just as if love goes out of the picture, the marriage will deteriorate. Jesus is calling the church at Ephesus the foundation of the work in Asia. Yeah? Saying, watch this and correct this. This is what the Spirit is saying to you. If only you'll listen. Yeah? And so it goes. On to Smyrna and Pergamon and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia. Until the climax to the non-correction and the failure to listen to the Holy Spirit has produced a church that's claiming to be all oh, so rich. Oh, we're very happy with the Lord. Thank you very much. Look how multiplied our 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 riches are. We're rich and uh, you know comfortable and delighted to be the Lord's people. And the Lord says, and you don't even know now how absolutely poor and blind and miserably naked you are. You've lost the spiritual riches of your relationship with me and of salvation. Your eyes have lost the vision. Yeah? Yeah. And I can't send you out in the world to fulfill the role for which I've appointed you. Yeah? Robe and role. Two associations in Scripture. The robe you wear is connected with the role that you have. Yeah. Well, that's got its correspondence in our world. We recognize a policeman, we recognize a soldier, we recognize a fireman by the robe they wear. Yeah. It indicates their role. Yeah. Well, that's what he's talking about. And he says, I can't send you out into the world because you don't have a role. You've lost your role for which I appointed you. How can I send you out? Jesus says, I can't speak my word through you. Yeah. I can't deliver my message to the nations. I have to spit you out of my mouth. And I've got to go back to beginning all over again to build my church. And God builds his universal work out of an individual work. Yeah. That's why Genesis is all about glimpsing God at work with individuals. Because by the time you get out of, out of Genesis and get into Exodus, you're starting to look at the complexity of lots of people. Yeah. And you lose track, you lose insight as to what's really going on. Study the history of the individuals in Genesis before you start embarking on seeking to understand what God's doing in a big world. Yeah? Get to be absolutely sure of what God does with individuals. And you'll see him working to create the righteousness of those individuals, yeah? 
and to establish the relationships of their families, multiplying out into the relationships between people in tribes and communities and ethnic groups and so on that make up the big picture of the history of the human experience. Yeah? It's all over. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> yes, look at that. Well, what, what it does mean is you're going to get some lunch. <laughs> so I guess that's pretty good, isn't it? Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you're grasping what this is all about and we'll pursue it after lunch again. Please remember, it's the big picture that we're seeking to understand and go away with so that then on your own you can start picking up smaller bits of the vision and you know how it all fits. And that's when you'll no doubt get questions that would warrant us having a workshop where we sit down and put the questions on the table and discuss them and air them in a way that will make it clear. <laughs>